Welcome to An Evening with Lori Frankel, brought to you by Snow Isle Libraries and Whidbey Reads. Please note that participant video and audio are turned off during tonight's program. Our conversation with Lori will be followed by a question and answer session. Please submit your questions for Lori anytime during tonight's program using Zoom's chat feature. All messages sent via chat will go directly to the panelists. Whidbey Reads is an annual program that brings Whidbey Island residents together to read and talk about a book and to attend a series of events that focus on themes related to that book. Whidbey Reads is a collaborative effort between Snow Isle Libraries, Whidbey Island Friends of the Libraries groups, and volunteers from each community on Whidbey Island. Whidbey Reads is funded entirely through donations from the Friends of the Library groups of Whidbey Island. I would like to thank our sponsors who made this event possible. The Friends of the Oak Harbor Library, the Friends of the Coopville Library, the Friends of the Freeland Library, the Friends of the Langley Library, the Friends of the Clinton Library, PFLAG Whidbey Island, and the Snow Isle Libraries Foundation. I would also like to thank longtime Whidbey Reads partners, The Book Rack, Kingfisher Books, Moonraker Books, and Skagit Valley College. This is How It Always Is and other books by Lori Frankel are available through Snow Isle Libraries in ebook and e audiobook format and in hard copy format at your local independent bookstore. Tonight's interviewer is Ken Harvey, who serves as the communications director at Snow Isle Libraries. Ken is a regular host of Snow Isle's Check It Out podcast and, has, and a co organizer of TEDx Snow Isle Libraries events and is a recipient of several awards, including Marketer of the Year. Local author Lori Frankel is the recipient of the Washington State Book Award and the Endeavor Award, author of three novels, all of which have been optioned for film or TV, one of the 50 most influential women in Seattle, and the New York Times bestselling author of the 2020 Whidbey Reads selection, This Is How It Always Is. Please join me in welcoming Lori Ken and Lori, you can take it away. How's that? We hear you. Okay. okay. Hurrah. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> it's so exciting when the technology works. <laughs> so I think we've all been a little bit um, challenged by technology during this pandemic, but Lori, I, I, we really want to thank you so much for making yourself available to us and to the Whidbey community for and, and offering your book to us to read. And congratulations on that novel. It is, I understand, your third novel that's been published. And I'm sure that we've got a, a number of attendees tonight who have, uh, have taken advantage of, of having your, your story uh, shared with them through that novel. And uh, we want to just chat a little bit about that. And then we're going to invite our attendees to send in some of their comments and questions as well. Yes, I can't wait. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, for doing this. And thank you all for being here. Um, I wish I could, I wish I could see you all. I wish I could see all of your faces. Um, and I, you know, and of course, I'm sorry we couldn't do this in person, but I'm thrilled that we can do it this way. Um, you know, it's, I'm just really glad to, to be doing this this evening. Well, congratulations again on the awards and recognitions that you've received. And I think it's just so incredible that your work has been translated in so many languages and and uh, enjoyed uh, and followed by so many, uh, obviously around the world, so. Thank you, thank you, that's very kind of you. It's, you know, it's very humbling is what it is. Well, let's talk a little bit about this, this story that's captivated the, the Whidbey uh, Island community. So uh, your first book, I mean, this book, um, This Is How It Always Is, tells a story of a family and it's a, it's a family that might be living next door to, to any of us. So tell us a little bit about this family, especially about the youngest child whose name is Poppy. Yes, yes, I love it. Um, I love that description because yeah, that, that is exactly my hope, that they, could, that they feel like they could be living next door to you. Um, I think the thing that is most unusual about this family isn't even that unusual, but it's a little bit it's a little bit unusual, which is that they have five children. Um, and at first they're all boys, but then it turns out that, that the youngest is, is not actually a boy, that the youngest in fact is a girl. Um, a fact which she communicates to her parents, not 
um, as soon as she can talk, but, but pretty soon thereafter. Um, and so it's a big family. I was really interested in, well, a number of things. I was really interested in um, looking at how transformation affects everyone in a family and transitions like a gender transition affect everyone in a family not just the kid in question and i was super interested going in in the fact that like kids are weird kids are so you know weird <laughs> and um and sometimes kids are weird in a way that we're like oh that's so quirky and unusual and aren't you creative and wonderful and sometimes kids are weird and we're like oh you need to get fixed or you need to go to therapy. And I was really interested in where we draw those lines. So the best way I could think of to do that was to look at as many as many kids as possible. So these are five kids and they're all weird <laughs> and, and they all present their their, their parenting challenges. And, um, and so it, I wanted to look at, um, you know, at different kinds of weird and, and where we draw those lines, where that seems okay to us and where it seems like cause for alarm. Um, if I could have done a dozen kids, I would have done a dozen kids, but my agent has felt that it was a lot of characters to keep track of. <laughs> so that's why there are five of them. Well, it's interesting that you would say a lot of characters keep track of. I'm, I'm actually from a family of six children and I'm the oldest of six. So, um, there are a lot of characters in our family. <laughs> yeah. can really relate to that. The 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 family. So sometimes when when writers write, especially uh, novelists, they are taking um, they're pulling really from from uh, real life experiences, and sometimes those those experiences are their own. So. Are there elements of the story that you were drawing from your own experience as a family? Yeah, for sure. So I think you're right. I think this is true of all, all novelists, I imagine, and it's certainly true for me. Um, all of my books have, have mo mostly made up things and, and traces of, of me and the people that I love. Um, I think it would be hard to build character without those people seeping in. Um, it is true that this is a book about, with, about a family with a transgender kid, and it is also true that I have a transgender kid. Um, that's pretty much where the similarity ends, though. Uh, first of all, she's an only child, <laughs> which makes it really like the opposite of having five or six kids, I imagine. Um, and, and so I had to make up all of the other kids in that family dynamic. I have one sister. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with big families, but, but mostly novels need plot. Um, they need heartbreak and they need intrigue and they need near misses and they need ticking clocks. And um, we have been very blessed in my family not to have any plot, <laughs> so, um, which is wonderful, it, but it did mean that everything had to be made up. It is also true that I was really, I was not interested in writing a memoir, I guess is how I want to say that. I was really keen to protect her privacy and and her story that is not mine to tell. Um, and so I was really, um, even if there had been more things in our life, I think that would have driven a plot, I'd have left them out because it's really important to me to you know, to, to protect the anonymity of the people who find their way into my novels. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Well, sometimes um, people can be congratulated if, if their own personal story isn't full of lots and lots of drama, so. That's right, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely the goal of your life, if not, you know, your, your novel. <laughs> so the, in your book, you had, you really kind of explore a lot of, um, relationship issues that happen between the different characters and um, that uh, affect the dynamics within the family. In this particular book, were you really looking to, to try and model how to parent a transgender child or, or was it also just navigating the waters of being a family with the different types of characters where one of them just happens to be dealing with gender identity? Yeah, I mean, it's such a great question. And I think, you know, I think the honest answer is probably all of the above. Um, I, what I think, I am, I mean, part of the answer is I, 
I am much more interested in asking questions than answering them, <laughs> for better or for worse. Um, I am much more interested in, in asking the question than in giving the answer. But I also think that there is no there is no answer on this one, and and on all questions like this, um, which in many ways is where the title comes from. Um, that that this is how it always is. That this is the story with parenting is there's. There's no answer, there's no playbook, there's, there's nobody who's gonna come to you and say, here's the right way to do it. And, and unfortunately, that's really hard because it means that you gotta show up every day and deal with what's in front of you and, and then evaluate how you did and then you know, take your mistakes into account and try to do better the next day. Um, I think that there's a lot of pressure in parenting to, like, to always, choose correctly and to always um, have the right answers and that's not how life is <laughs> so and it's definitely not how parenting is and even if it were like even if you somehow figured out all the answers bad news children change like by the hour so that kid who you were parenting yesterday comes down for breakfast in the morning and is a different person and and you have to adapt so there's an extent to which i hope the moral of the story here is like unconditional love. You're gonna love your kid no matter what. And that's probably pretty good parenting advice regardless. But I also hope that some of the moral of the story is, and you're gonna screw up. And sometimes you're gonna make the wrong call. And sometimes you're gonna make the right call. And then later on, it's gonna be the wrong call. And, and you gotta parent that way too. Um, so I hope it's both a model and, a, and the freedom to, to let yourself off the hook a little bit um, for the kind of imperfections that are parenting. Well, it seems like you, through the story, you, you are giving permission, or at least that you're acknowledging that, that sometimes you're struggling to know what the right thing is to do, and you're just trying to, you're trying to make it through the day, <laughs> through the night, and into the next day. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and it can be hard sometimes. As you said, there's not a roadmap. That's laying it all out with uh, with with a certainty that the story is going to turn out perfectly. Right. So. Right, and and really there is no perfectly, and I think that frequently um, trans kids are presented as very anomalous, very unusual, and in fact, I think that this is how it always is. Um, most parents are are not going to have a transgender kid, but all parents are going to have a kid who sometimes comes to them and says something that they think, I don't know what to do about that. I don't know how to help that. I don't know how to solve that problem. Um, it is the state of parenting. And, um, and I think that that, is, that that is how it always is. And the more we acknowledge that, um, the, the better the world is for everybody. Well, one of the things that seems to be so common with most families is that um, it's very rare that any family stays in one house while all the children grow up. So many of us deal with, uh, with moving from one community to another. And that's an element of your story, of this story as well, where the family moves uh, from Wisconsin to the state of Washington. And would you like to tell us a little bit uh, about that move and what's, what's, what goes into it and why Seattle is their destination? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the short answer is a really short answer, which is plot. <laughs> um, I, in order to drive the second half of the story, I needed to to uproot these people from from the place where they are. And you know, I'm a novelist, so like I get into this idea of moving from the center to the edge, and from the the kind of flat brown middle to the to the kind of craggy greenness that we have going on here in, in Washington. Um, and, and so that's definitely part of it. It also is important because it forces the family into this decision um, that they don't make unless they move. So if everyone knew them growing up, then they would, they would have watched this child transition. Once they move, they suddenly have this really impossible decision to make, which is do they tell everybody uh, this thing that is complicated and difficult to understand and not really any of their business or do they do they do they not um do they not tell and and um and you know the consequences of that and so part of it is that that drives the plot um and 
and part of it is that I know a lot of trans kids at this point and a lot of parents of those kids. Um, and I know as many of them who are keeping this secret as who are not keeping the secret. So it seemed like an important thing for them to be able to live both ways. And in order to do that, I had to move them across the country. Um, Seattle is a, is a particularly interesting example I mean, the short answer is because I live here, <laughs> and um, and I'm I'm not new exactly to Seattle. I guess I've been here for oh my gosh, like 15 years now. But I feel I feel new to Seattle. I think I still look at it through the eyes of someone new here, and that and that makes it um, easier for me to write about. It is also true that Seattle is a really really progressive place to live in this country, um, and Seattle Public Schools has been fantastic and I wanted to talk about that um, and you know and, and model that that a little bit um, again even though they couldn't be super on board because of plot um, it was really nice to be able to incorporate that into the book so do you think where where there are real life stories um, people living uh, some experiences and they're looking for a place that they can call home that's more accepting that the real life Seattle would, would, would live up to their expectations? I do think so, yeah. I, um, Seattle Public Schools has been really, really remarkable. Um, not, not so much in that they have said, oh, we're going we're gonna to do all of these things to accommodate your kid, but in fact, the opposite of that. They said, all right, I don't care. And, 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 and in many ways, that's, that is, that is a much more um, heartening and uh, response for everybody. Their, their position that like, of course, of course you might want to, to use a bathroom that is not the bathroom indicated on your birth certificate. Of course, we will adjust your name on documents that come home or um, attendance sheets in case it's not your teacher who shows up, but a substitute teacher. Um, of course this happens. And of course that's not strange or uncomfortable or um, a thing that we need to get upset about. And I have been really, really grateful for that response from day one. And I, and I have found it to be true pretty much across the board in Seattle Public Schools, which is a really diverse district. And and so I think that's saying something. Hmm. So in the story, we you have this element that you've woven into the story where the uh, the dad, who's a stay-at-home dad, it essentially becomes a, a fairy tale a fairy tailor. So oh. he, <laughs> he he writes fairy tales and shares them as they go along and um, and you know I find that very interesting. So many of us, I think, as, as adults, find ourselves returning to fairy tales as we have children. So it's like we, we, we live with fairy tales as we're children. While we're children, we, we become teenagers. We see ourselves growing up. We drift away from them. And suddenly, when we have children again, we find ourselves being recaptured by those tales. Yeah. And so in your novel, um, Ken, uh, dad, um, writes these and and you use this through your your book so so why and and what role do those tales play in you know in the lives of the of the children in this family but maybe all of our lives yeah oh yes i love that you call him a fairy taler that's really nice um that's really lovely yeah i that so much of what this book became was not in the seed of it for me. It wasn't in the original idea, but I started with that fairy tale. And one of the things I thought was that it was gonna help the reader follow, follow all of this, these many characters, some of whom change gender in the middle. Um, and I thought we're gonna need a device to help keep track of everybody. And I thought this will be easy and, um, and, it'll, be, and it'll be easy to write and it'll be fun to read. Um, and then it was the most enormous pain in my butt through this entire process because every time I changed the main part of the story, which I changed wholesale and repeatedly, I had to change that fairy tale because it mirrors so much what's going on in the story. Um, 
However, <laughs> I remained committed to it anyway, because you are right. Um, fairy tales are uh, formative. They are most of the first movies our kids see. They are most of the first stories we tell our children. They are most of the first books that our kids read. Um, they are something that we return to all of our lives. They cross time and nationality and culture. Um, and so they're really great and wonderful stories. However, they are problematic stories for lots of people and for trans people in particular, um, and I think for kids in particular, because the moral of the story is like, if you're good, then you get sudden and painless transformation. And that manifests as like, you are pretty, you, you, look, you look good on the outside. Um, and that transformation is painless and instantaneous and complete. And that's not how it changes. That's not how it changes for anyone. Um, change is slow and it is often painful and it always has some trace of what came before and what came next. And you wouldn't have it any other way. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. So I wanted to think about the ways we could, um, I could salvage, I could use the fairy tale and what's wonderful about it and, and change it to make it something that speaks more to people whose gender changes or people whose life changes or people who grow up and are no longer tiny children anymore, which is all of us. Um, so that's, so that was the, that was the idea that I went in with. Um, and it was really fun, but, but it did drive me insane. <laughs> well, I understand that you spent some time in Thailand. I did. And that that part of that time, or maybe the entire trip, was around researching um, for this book. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. So that is another thing that was that I did not know going into this book. Um, I didn't know that they were going to go to Thailand. I originally, so I knew I wanted like a mother daughter road trip. I thought they might return to Wisconsin because I like the kind of full circle idea of that story. Um, and then I got to the end of part two and typed, she agreed to go to Thailand. And then I thought, oh no, <laughs> because I had never been to Thailand. So then I deleted it and wrote like, she agreed to go to Idaho. I've been to Idaho, <laughs> like, how, you know, this will be great. Um, but no, no, it, it had to be Thailand. Um, I, I wanted to get this family out of their bubble. I, I knew I needed them to meet some other transgender people. There were so many ways I could have done that in country. Um, but then it turned out that I needed this other thing. And it was, the, it was this bit that I didn't realize until I was well into the book, which is that I really wanted to end without answering the question without saying, and then he went back to being a boy forever, or, and then she knew she was going to be a girl forever. I wanted to end somewhere in the middle. This is very difficult in English because you have to, you have to narrate with a pronoun. And so in order to tell the end of the story, I had to find some other way of landing these folks in the middle. And, um, and the answer to that question turned out to be Buddhism. And the answer to that question turned out to be Thailand. So then I spent, like after I figured this out and realized it couldn't be Idaho, <laughs> I, uh, I spent like 24 hours, you know, Googling it and looking at people's travel photos and, you know, plonking my little avatar down on the Google street view and like tootling about Bangkok. Um, and went to the Thai restaurant down the hill for me and like, you know, ordered some pod thai and wrote down some adjectives. And then I called a travel agent the next day and said, yeah, I need to go to Thailand. And she said, great, what do you want to see? And I said, I don't know, Thailand? Because I had no idea. Um, and then I said, I also, I, like, I need to leave next week because I, I can't finish this book um, without, without going to Thailand. And I knew I was going to need to see a clinic and that that wasn't going to be like something I could just wander into, not going to be something on the tourist itinerary. So um, we had to get government permission to do that. And then I got on a plane and flew halfway around the world. So that is it's so fascinating, <laughs> everything you just said. Um, but let me, let me start with this. What is there? Where does the this third gender fit into the Thai culture? Yeah, um, seamlessly is 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 how I want to answer that question, and um, and really mostly and most 
seamlessly with trans women rather than trans men. Um, but it is very much a third gender in, in Thailand. Um, and, and again, you know, in a, in a not dissimilar way, I, I think to what I was saying about the school system, it's, it's not so much that they're saying, oh, we're so tolerant and we're so open-minded and, and we're so accepting and accommodating um, and progressive. It's not that at all. It's just, you know, an acknowledgement that there are lots of people who, who, are, who are this. Um, there are lots of people who feel this way. There are lots of people who identify as this thing. It would be insane to pretend that was not true when it clearly is true. Um, and so, and, and, that is, and that is true in, in Thai culture, um, which is a really remarkable, remarkable thing. So does that just get around the whole concept of acceptance? It's, I mean, I don't know if it gets acceptance, around. Acceptance, acknowledgement. Uh... It's a, you're right, it's a different, it's a different thing. Um, and it's something that I think is maybe further along on, on the path. That is the path, like acceptance and, and tolerance um, are probably first steps on a path that eventually gets to, to its, to its not necessarily even being something that we have to talk about or think about. Um, and I think that those are probably really different things. Hmm. So I, I do want to just, uh, <laughs> I kind of want to jump back to something you said, because I know that any, anyone who's a writer or a want to be writer, uh, caught what you said that you wrote and then they went to Thailand. <laughs> and so I, I just need to have you just kind of acknowledge that sometimes the stories can suddenly start to write themselves and then real life has to follow them, right? Yeah, that's exactly what happens. And I and I feel like this is the kind of thing that writers say all the time and it sounds really woo-woo and um and pretend and I feel like when I used, before I started doing this, I would hear people say this and think it was insane. Um, actually, it's not that I thought it was insane. I thought they were lying, is what it is. <laughs> like, I thought that um, they were saying this thing that wasn't actually true, but it turns out to be quite true in my experience. Um, and that's exactly what it is. For me, what I find is I have to write the beginning myself. And about two thirds of the way through, if I have done my job, the characters start to make their own decisions um, because they've become predictable people with stimulus <laughs> that that you throw that you throw at them, um, and you know, and and I think that in the same way that you have friends who you know really well, and and you could guess where they would go on vacation, and. And the, the difference between your friends who would go to Thailand and your friends who would go to Idaho is like, those are just, you know, that is a predictable thing. That is something that it's not so strange to imagine you knowing about a person. And that's what happens with characters. And so um, they, they kind of take over um, at some point, which is great because it's how I know that it's working. Um, eventually I write like I read where these things come out of my fingers and I think, oh, oh my gosh, I did not see that coming. <laughs> um, which is really, which is really astonishing. My, uh, my husband was reading the draft I'm working on finishing of my, my next book last night and he was laughing at something and I said, what are you laughing at? He said, you're really funny. And he read it to me and I said, no, oh, that's not me. That's, that's the character. I, she, I'm not funny, like she's funny. That's what happens, <laughs> not at first, but like eventually, eventually. Well, it's, a, it's an amazing thing where characters become real individuals and, and they become who they are and they, be, and they become who they are on the pages of the story, so. Yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really an amazing thing. I mean, and then you miss them because, because they become people with whom you've spent like a lot of time. Uh, and you know, and you know a lot about, and and you're invested in their story, and and then they go away again. So in some in some ways, this this concept of becoming who you are um, is also part of the, the the story of this family in the novel. Um, each person being given room to become who they are, and and this issue. Uh, the transgender issue really seems to be an issue within our country 
Um, why do you think it's an issue here that's different than it is in Thailand? I think we are not as far down the path. Um, I think that we have, I think there are a lot of reasons. There are a lot of answers to this question. One is that I think that the coverage of this issue, the response to um, the media portrayal of has been dishonest um, in a way that I think is intended to turn out votes or something like that. Um, I think it is fear mongering and, and I think that that's dishonest in addition to being reprehensible. I just think it is untrue. Um, it, it, it is not the reason I wrote the book, but it was certainly one of the reasons that I, that I did is that um, I think that often uh, transgender people are portrayed as um, very, very unusual and strange and scary and possibly violent um, and and definitely lying and and it's and and none of that is true um, and in fact not even the the that unusual is true um, as you see in places like Thailand so uh, I do think that the first step is the sort of tolerance and acceptance and education and all of those things but I think it is just the first step on the way to saying this is all around you and has always been all around you it it has never been true that um, that there weren't transgender people. Um, it, it, there have always been transgender people. And if you think that, that you don't know any people who are transgender, it's probably just because you haven't seen them naked, which is great. Um, it's great because we shouldn't really probably be looking at our friends naked, but it also is, doesn't mean that it isn't true. Um, so I think that we are at the beginning of a sea change. And I think that it is happening. Um, I have talked to lots and lots of kids and kids are completely unfazed by this. Um, adults wig out, kids, it's, it's not, again, it's not that these kids have, have open hearts and, and they have understood this thing. It's just that their reaction is very much like, is this about me? No, then I don't care. Why would I care where you go to the bathroom? Um, and and that that is really really changing wholesale. And you you talk to um, to young people, and and this is a non-issue. And and that gives me great hope because I think that's the kind of thing that doesn't go backwards. Well, thank you for that answer. I I wanted to just alert the audience. So we're gonna we're gonna start taking some questions um, from you and and in just a minute or two. Uh, so make sure that you uh, start sending, send, sending them. <laughs> um, now, Lori, I'm just wondering, you had mentioned your own experience, uh, your family's experience with the Seattle school system, and also the in the novel, the their experience as they moved to Seattle. And I'm wondering if there are some things that you would, that you would, um, share with parents or caregivers or even educators about um, what to do as they, what, what to do if they, if they're experiencing uh, a child in their lives who is, is not, is not talking, walking or doing the things that they expect. Yeah. Right. I mean, right. And it's, it's exactly that. All, always your children are doing things not quite as you expect. Um, on this particular front, there are so many resources. It's another thing that's been really interesting in talking about this book. I get a lot of email from parents whose, whose kids um, are even like 10 years older than mine who had really different experience um, because there were so many fewer resources. Whereas when we figured out like what this was and what we were dealing with, and I Googled the matter, there is a support group in my zip code, which is, you know, which is not certainly going to be true everywhere, um, but, but is true here. There are a lot of really, really great resources. Um, there's a local group called Gender Diversity, which um, in fact um, is, is local, not just to Seattle, but um, to sort of all of Western Washington. Um, and, and their, their kind of bigger um, organization, which is called Trans Families. Um, and they have really 
they've grown enormously, even in the last five years that I have, that I have known them. Um, and, you know, then the other thing that's true is it turned out that, you know, I went to school and I said, look, you know, here's this thing that's going on in my household. I think you might want a heads up about it. And they said, oh, yeah, we know all about that. Um, you know, we, we know exactly what to do. Here, meet these other parents. Here, meet these other children. Um, and that is enormously helpful. Um, it is something that I think about I'm as a writer that uh, because I don't have colleagues um, that it is important for me to leave my house and talk to other humans and hear about their experiences because it will help me among other things with my own um, it is something I've been thinking a lot about in the past couple months as we have none of us been leaving our house that um, that you know that this support of of meeting other people and and talking to them about our stuff and hearing about theirs um, is a is a huge is a huge loss and it will be um, really remarkable to have it back again I think well I think it's so helpful for any of us to discover that we're not the only ones yeah that we're not alone that there's someone else can understand and um, and so if, if someone was looking for resources to help them with, with this issue um, because there's someone in their family uh, or someone in their circle, uh, what would you recommend? They should go to my website <laughs> because um, on, the, on the page for the book on my website, I've linked to lots and lots of resources and some good books. And, um, and so do you want to mention your website's address? Yes, it's, it's I am Laurie Frankel. It is lauriefrankel.net. Because LaurieFrankel.com is not me, somebody else, <laughs> which I'm sure she's also lovely. Um, and her parents apparently were like my parents; they were on a wavelength. Um, so, so yeah. But you know, the other thing is just googling this matter um, is going to turn up all sorts of stuff. GenderDiversity.org is a great place to start. TransFamilies.org is a great place to start. Um, or, or you know, I have lots of links. So if there was a um... If there was one or two things that you would hope that someone who read this novel took away from it, yeah. what might those be? Wider ranges of normal. Wider ranges of normal make the world better for everyone. Um, that's, that's, that's what I want to say. Um, and also, don't freak out, <laughs> I guess is the other one. Um, parenting is really, really hard, and, um, and there are no right answers. And... Um, and everything changes moment to moment. So you're showing up and not knowing what to do isn't a bad thing. It means that you're doing it right, I think. So your book was written and, and published uh, in 2017. So now three years ago, can you believe that? I cannot believe that. <laughs> so if you, were, if you were writing it today, uh, you think it would look or sound differently with the characters? have become a little different than they are today or would the, would the story end differently? That's such an interesting question. Um, that's such an interesting question. I, well, so medically some things have progressed from the book. So blockers have come a long way, even from, even from three years ago. And that's wonderful news. Um, and so that might have changed those, those parts of that story um, somewhat, perhaps. Um, so that's the kind of easy answer. <laughs> the harder answer is they basically have to rip this thing out of my hands at some point because I would edit it forever. Um, <laughs> I cut over 250,000 words from this book. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I am a tinkerer. I write really lousy rough drafts and then go back to the beginning and make it better over and over and over and over and over. Uh, and at some point they say, enough, you cannot screw with this book anymore. <laughs> but if they continue to let me do so, I would continue to do so. And who knows what would happen. <laughs> So yes, it, it's nice to have an editor or publisher who'll say, okay, stop yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. So I'm just wondering, um, one last question before we take some comments or questions from uh, some of the folks who've been watching and listening. 
with the quarantine that came from this pandemic, uh, did that did you suddenly find that you had much more time to do writing, and um, and were you able to really challenge uh, channel all of your creativity and pour it into a new story? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's really funny. Uh, well, so I have a small child, and um, and and she needs to be educated by you know me. If there's not going to be school, um, I've been so so lucky in that I work from home. I mean, I work from home anyway, um, and 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 my husband has been able to work from home. We are very lucky that we have uh, enough space, more or less, for people to retire to their own corners. Um, but it is definitely um, hard to be creative or productive um, when, when there is a small human who demands reasonably one's attention and when that child is not going to be educated by anyone but me <laughs> is a really different ball game I have found. Um, I am at a, I am, I am super putting the very, very, very finishing touches on the next book, which will be out in like a year from now. Um, and, and are you forbidden to tell us anything about it? I used to be, but now I can tell you everything about it. <laughs> uh, it's called One, Two, Three. It is a, it is also about a family. It's about a, but sisters this time, triplets, tri teenage triplets, um, who live in a very small town um, with a dark past and, and nefarious doings. They live downstream from a defunct chemical plant. And, um, and it turns out that that past is not so past after all, and they have to take matters into their own hands. Um, and that was scheduled for February 2021, and it's now been pushed back to May for obvious reasons. And, um, and I'm and I'm just finishing it, which is which is very exciting. And and again, similarly, I I mean I have just I have I am still thinking, oh well, maybe I want to change this one thing, but we're in proofreading. Like this thing has been typeset. I am I am forbidden to change anything that will change the layout of this book. I can I can essentially add like really skinny commas and that's it. Um, and and that requires extreme concentration um because i can recite that book at this point because i've read it so many times and yet i now need to go through it and proofread it and make sure that i have not left out words or um you know all of those things and it requires just an extraordinary amount of focus which is the opposite <laughs> of homeschooling um and so that has presented its challenges i do though i have also started the next one after that because those are such different processes. I can do them both at the same time, and um, and it's and it's. I find it much easier to start the next one, in that it seems like a useful thing to model for my kid. Like this is terrible. I have done a horrible job, but I sat down and I did it, and tomorrow I will make it better. And and I feel like that's probably a pretty useful model for the for the eleven year old set, even as it is painful for the you know writing a book set. Well, so many of our writer, uh, so many of our, our attendees uh, are thrilled that you were willing to share kind of what you're working on. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm thank you. I appreciate. It. I can't tell you what that means to me at this stage. Well, and several of them are actually also asking when you when you begin writing a story, is the plot just fully hatched in your head already? Do you have a have a, a whole list of characters already kind of outlined out? Or, or do you discover that somewhere, you know, after the third paragraph, oh my gosh, I need an extra child, or I need, it should have been quadruplets, not triplets, or, and then yes. you have to go back and. Yeah. Yes, B, it's B. <laughs> um, almost everything changes over the course of a novel for me. Um, the first draft is really about just getting getting to the end so that I have some idea what has happened. It feels to me very much like I, can't, I don't know what, I don't know what's going to happen to these people because I haven't met them yet. And so the first draft is the process of meeting these people and therefore realizing what they're going to do and therefore going back and 
and fixing all of the stuff that no longer makes sense. At the beginning, I'm really just guessing about things and then yeah I go back and say like oh no you know what I need this character to do this thing I need this character to be a teacher I need this character to have children I need this character to be a photographer because that's that is going to play in 400 pages from now and I just didn't know it until until I got there um so no I have almost none of the plot <laughs> at all. Um, I usually know the character, like I have a broad outline of the characters. I also almost always have many more characters than can go in the book. So one of the things that happens in later drafts is five or six or ten people become one person. Uh, and, and that of course yields inconsistencies, so then that all has to go back and get fixed. Well I think that that's, that's incredibly useful to hear for many of us who have these story story ideas in our head or in our hearts. And I, I think about something that you said early in our conversation, which was essentially about being a parent, that your goal shouldn't be to be shouldn't be perfection because you're 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 working with real life and and just the imperfections of life. And sometimes it seems that some would be authors get they get bogged down and paralyzed because yeah. they want the first words out to be perfect and then yeah. they want every word in between between the first and the last to be perfect and yeah. that's that's just not the way it is i do not find that it is the way it is and i do not find it to be a useful pressure um and some of that is just the way i write i think that people who have spent say a year outlining a book and have a really developed outline and they know exactly what's going to happen might be able to do what you're talking about which is like really concentrate on a sentence by sentence level but i know a lot of writers and i know very few of them who write that way um what i say to students all the time is we're not going to fix the commas in a paragraph that we are later going to cut and in my case, that's much more like we are not going to worry about, you know, the like what this character is wearing or doing or thinking or went to college or like so many things because that character is not actually making the final draft. We're not going to spend a lot of time doing research on this plot point because that plot point is not going anywhere. Um, and, and that is a discipline, definitely. I, I feel sometimes like a service I could provide to writers and, and would-be writers is to let them look at my first drafts, but, but I, I would never, like, no one can, it's, in fact, it terrifies me that somebody will, like, steal my computer and read these things. They're so bad. They're just, I mean, they're, like, appallingly bad. Um, but I do think it would be, if I, if I could get over myself, if I could get over the embarrassment of it, it would be useful for people to see how terrible it is because it is quite terrible. And, and that is because it isn't finished yet. You know, and I just, I sort of think of it like if you wrote the first three chapters and gave it to somebody and they're like, well, it doesn't have an ending. Well, right, because you didn't write the ending yet. And that is how I think of revision. It's, it's not bad. It's just like, it's on its way. Um, but it, I really go in knowing, knowing astonishingly little and almost everything I think I know I'm wrong about. Well, have you, have you become or been part of a writer's group? That's a question that one of our, our listeners is. Uh, that's a great question. So, no, I have not. Um, when I started writing novels, I was teaching full time and I was reading, uh, I was reading a lot of papers and a lot of short stories and, and I was teaching, um, you know, because I was teaching writing and um, I needed to like read and comment on other people's work like a hole in the head. I didn't, I just didn't have the time for it. Um, I was spending so much time, you know, talking, critiquing other people's writing already. Um, and, and that's really the beauty of the, the writer's group. So I didn't need that. And I think because I went into it that way, that is like, because I started writing that way, um, I, I kind of, I didn't learn how to do it with a writer's group. Um, I will say too, that I think writer's groups are terrifically useful for people who need, um, like, 
motivation, who need deadlines, who need it to like, I will be reading with these people every other Monday, or I have to hand in 20 pages um, by the weekend, and who won't write it otherwise. I do not fall into that. I have many problems <laughs> with, with writing. I have many challenges. Motivation doesn't happen to be one of them. Um, so, so I don't need that per se. Um, and I think that writers groups are really useful for people who, like for whom feedback on, on chapter one would be useful or people who are writing essays or people who are writing short stories. Um, where like you can have a group look at the whole and comment on it. Whereas if I give 20 pages of this thing to a writer's group as I went along, they would be like, this is terrible. And I would say, yes, it is. <laughs> and that would not be useful to any of us. Um, so I think if I were a different kind of writer, it would probably be more useful than it is. Writer's groups are really wonderful for lots and lots of people. I just don't happen to be one of them. <laughs> Yeah, what that your comment just now reminds me of confirmation bias. They would say, this is terrible. And you would say, yeah, that confirmed my own bias. It is terrible. <laughs> I'm going to stop right here. Exactly. So, so I'm glad that that, um, that that did not happen with this with this story. One of our um, one of our audience member members wanted to know if you learned about parenting from your own parents. Oh, and is that what is that is that part of what is reflected in the story? That's a really sweet question. Oh, that's a really nice question. Um, my parents are lovely, excellent humans. Um, what I'm always saying to them is that I was the world's easiest child. <laughs> I am definitely a rule follower, um, and that they just don't know anything because about it about like how to deal with a child who is ill behaved because I am so well behaved and always was. Um, they're very great and I'm very close with them. So the short answer to that question is yes, absolutely. Um, in the book, I was, I, I was really interested in having, um, I was really interested in the fact that two parents could, both of them, be really eager to get on board and support this child. Um, I had, and it's not that it, I mean, there are there are definitely parents out there who would say to their, who have said to their transgender children, you know, you have, you, you may not be this way. If you continue to be this way, I will not love you anymore. You have to get out of my house. I had no interest in writing it. I have no interest in putting more of that into the world. Um, none, none at all. So, um, so I knew that that wasn't going to be the story, but I was really interested in the fact that having said, yes, of course we will love and support you no matter what, that two people could really disagree on the best way to do it. Um, whether is not an interesting question to me. Will you love your child no matter what is not an interesting question to me, but how will you love your child no matter what? How will you support your child is, is a very interesting question. Um, so these, these parents don't always agree on how to do that, um, and yet are able to have a conversation about it. Uh, and, and I think that those, those are very, those are things that are really important to me um, as a daughter and as a parent and uh, as a reader, um, and therefore also as a writer. Well, I think that that, that interplay between um, the parents in this story is part of um, what so many of the re of the readers found so um, attractive, compelling, um, something that they wanted to have in their own relationships, yeah. uh, something they wanted to experience. And some of our, our, I'm looking at some of the comments that we received. Uh, one person talked about how much one of her big takeaways was how much joy what there was in the story that was associated with having a different child. And, and that uh, challenges can sometimes lead to joy. Yeah. And another uh, writer said that your use of, uh, of phrases was, was really intriguing mm -hmm. and that you were very playful and yet un unexpected and wondered how difficult is it to keep surprise going through, through a story. Oh, interesting. Gosh, I don't know. I don't know what phrases. Um, yes. So the first part, the joy, absolutely. Um, I think that there is, I mean, I think that there is a lot of joy in parenting. And I, 
I find personally that it is often those, I mean, the, the, the ways in which your children surprise you are, are these are highlights because I think it's, it's when you see them becoming their own people, um, you know, where, where you see like, oh, you thought of that all on your own. That, that wasn't me and it, and it wasn't daddy. It was like something that came out of you. Um, and you know, I mean, kids are funny. They're, they're weird and funny and they're unpredictable. Um, and that becomes less true of, of adults. Um, a, adults surprise you less often, I think, than, than children do and they change less than children do. And there's so much joy there. Um, children have high highs and low lows and, and that makes the highs really wonderful to be a part of. Um, and I feel really, really blessed to, you know, to be a part of that. Um, like my kid is over the moon because um, I told her we could try to find someplace that had carry out ice cream after next weekend when school ends. And like, that's so exciting. And, you know, and I sort of think like, eh, <laughs> you will have to interact with people and that is so frightening to me right now. And, um, and so, you know, it's good, it's good. It's good to have that joy. Um, and as for the, the story and the, you know, the phrasing and um, being surprising, um, as I say, that, that happens for me as it goes along. Um, it is very much this situation where at the beginning I'm dragging it and then at some point it overtakes me. It's, it's going faster than I am. Um, and it's all I can do to, to write it quickly enough. Uh, and that is, and it is very surprising. It is, it is astonishing. Do you find, is, is that the point at which the characters are actually doing their own conversations? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. They're doing their own conversations, they're making their own decisions, they are determining the plot. Um, it, is, it is thrilling. It is really, it's, really um, every, it's just this thrilling magic moment every time where you think, oh, ha ha, I can, I can let go. <laughs> like I've rested the hill and if I let go, it will just keep on going on its own and everything's gonna be great from here on out. And I have to go back and fix all of this other stuff that's terrible now, but like now I know what to do. They give you, they give you direction. It's, it's, it's a delight. Well, Lori, this has been delightful. We only have a minute or two left, but I wanted to just share with you that um, several um, of our audience members have, have indicated how much this story meant to them. Um, either they are, they've been desiring or struggling to write their own memoirs or their own stories, and so you've inspired them. Others um, have some life experiences where they have someone in their family, someone in their, in their classroom, someone on, maybe on the job who is, um, is dealing with issues that, that you've, you've touched on and explored in the book, and they just wanted to let you know how much, how, how you've impacted them and you've encouraged them, you've shown them the joy and the, and the challenges and that there's, um, there's hope, uh, but there's also some uncertainty. You know, the, the story is not done when the last page is reached. And, um, but they wanted to thank you and, they, and so I'm, I'm passing on their gratitude to you. Yeah, and I, I pass my gratitude right back. I am so, so grateful for those kindnesses and and to people for reading um, and for being here this evening um, and, and for saying that, it, I mean, it truly, it means the world. So last question, and that is, will there be a sequel? Oh, <laughs> um, so I used to say, no, definitely not. And now I say, probably not. <laughs> um, there, so, and I have two sort of more nuanced answers, I suppose, to that. Well, I have a lot of answers to that question. Um, well, what, if the what if the characters wrote it for you? Oh, that's right. Yeah, maybe. Um, well, so, like, one of the things is that um, I really wanted to not answer the question this time. And if it went on, it, I would definitely have to answer that question. Um, it is true that puberty would be a whole different book uh, for this. It, it's not an epilogue. It's not another chapter. It would be a whole different thing. Um, and, and so that makes it tempting. <sighs> I'm also working at present on the TV show, which I don't know will ever happen, but in the event that it might, I have sketched it out through five more seasons, five seasons, um, of which this is roughly the first. So that takes her up through college. Um, so that would be sequel-esque. 
Um, the other thing is that I have been thinking of this new book that I'm finishing now um, as a companion piece. And I hesitate to say that because that will not be clear to really anyone but me. <laughs> um, that is, it doesn't overlap in any, any of the characters or any of the particulars. Um, but for me, the moral of the story is very much the same, which is this thing that you think is really weird and particular to you and frightening and, and, um, and, and embarrassing sometimes and, um, and makes you very worried about yourself and your place in the world is in fact true everywhere for everyone. And, and your question is only how, how you're gonna rise up. And, and so for me, that's, that's always what I am writing about. Um, these kind of wider, wider ranges of normal. And, um, and, and that's what the new book is about too. So it won't feel like a sequel and it won't answer any of your questions, but, but in, but you can read it knowing that in my heart, <laughs> it's a, it's a companion piece. Laurie, this has been a delightful conversation. Thank you so much for spending this, this hour with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It has, been, it has been my pleasure and you are lovely to talk to. I could do this all night long. Katrina, we're gonna put it back in your hands. Very good. We hope you enjoyed tonight's program, An Evening with Lori Frankel, brought to you by Snow Isle Libraries and Whidbey Reads. We would like to thank Lori Frankel and Ken Harvey for joining us tonight. And thank you to everyone in the audience. Have a good night.